Welcome to our lecture this afternoon, our continued consideration of the free offer of the gospel and critique of the teaching of the free offer or well-meant offer of the gospel. Let's begin our session this afternoon with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we glorify thy name, the triune God of heaven and earth the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our God and our Father, for Christ's sake. Bless our consideration of the truth of thy word this afternoon, especially as we examine an assault upon that word and the preaching of that word. Give us clarity of mind and readiness of speech, and may all that we say accord with thy holy word and carry away thy divine approval. Pardon graciously our sins, for Jesus' sake. Amen. In this series of lectures, we have been examining critically the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel. This teaching has become widely accepted in Reformed and Presbyterian churches by our day. It is defended by many ministers and theologians in these churches. Not only do they vigorously defend the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel, but they also charge that those who oppose this teaching are hyper-Calvinists. That is, they have taken Calvinism to a radical and to an extreme position, something inconsistent with what true Calvinism is. It is our view that the defenders of the well-meant offer of the gospel are the ones who are guilty of inconsistency with regard to true Calvinism. Not only have they sold true Calvinism for Arminian pottage, but they are defending a view that is contrary to Holy Scripture and to the Reformed Confessions. Just a reminder of the main tenets, the three main tenets of the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel. Number one, it is the teaching of the well-meant offer that there is a certain love of God for all men and a desire of God to save all men, reprobate and elect alike. And that this desire of God to save all men is expressed to all who come under the preaching of the gospel. And that is the second tenet of the well-meant offer of the gospel, that in a certain sense, our Lord Jesus Christ died for all men, at the very least, for all who come into contact with the preaching of the gospel. And then third, in the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit offers salvation to all men, proclaiming to all who sit under the preaching of the gospel, whether in the established congregation or on the mission field, a desire of God to save them, God's love for them, offering them salvation. In our critique of the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel, we have seen that this teaching undermines the authority of the preaching of the gospel. The gospel is not an ineffectual offer 
but the gospel comes as a command, a call to all who hear the preaching of the gospel, a call to repent of their sins and to believe on Jesus Christ, the only Savior of sinners. Those who defend the well-meant offer of the gospel take away this authority of the preaching of the gospel and instead teach that the gospel is a powerless offer. Christ the King is reduced to a helpless beggar. We have also seen that the well-meant offer of the gospel contradicts the twofold purpose of God in the preaching of the gospel. Not only are there two observable results to the preaching of the gospel, there are. Down through history, there are some who believe the preaching of the gospel, but others who reject the gospel in hatred and in unbelief. But those two results of the preaching of the gospel are in reality the two purposes of God with the preaching of the gospel. Through the preaching of the gospel, God works repentance and faith in some. But through the preaching of the gospel, God also hardens others in their sins and in their unbelief, leaving them without excuse in the day of judgment. In both cases, the apostle teaches in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through 16, the preaching of the gospel is a sweet savor pleasing unto God, both as a savor of life unto life and as a savor of death unto death. In this lecture, I want to consider one very serious implication of the teaching of the free offer of the gospel, and that is the teaching of free will. The dread error of free will. Free offer implies free will. Let me be clear, I am not contending that everyone who teaches the well-meant offer of the gospel openly and publicly embraces the teaching of free will. The teaching of free will is that the sinner is able to exercise the freedom of will that God has given to him in order to choose God and to choose Christ and to choose salvation. The great reformer Martin Luther identified this error as the chief error of the Roman Catholic Church of his day. There were all kinds of departures and a multitude of grievous errors in the Roman Catholic Church by the time of the Reformation. But Luther identified this error, Rome's teaching of free will as her outstanding error. And that remains true until this day. In agreement with Martin Luther, John Calvin also saw free will as the most grievous error of the multitude of Rome's 
errors. This was the teaching of the Armenians at the time of the Synod of Dort. They taught that man can do nothing to earn or merit his salvation. He cannot do anything, but he can desire to be saved. He can want salvation and all the benefits of salvation. I am not contending that every proponent of the well-meant offer of the gospel openly teaches free will. Many do not. And they would be appalled by the allegation that they are promoting free will. But what I am contending in this lecture is that those who teach the well-meant offer of the gospel and who defend that teaching are implicitly endorsing the heresy of free will. Consistency demands that if you teach the free offer, you must also teach free will. The two go hand in hand. They really have no choice in the matter, if you will. If you buy the entire package of the free offer of the gospel, you must also buy one part of the package, which is the teaching of free will. Let me compare what I am contending to another false teaching that has made significant headway in Reformed and Presbyterian churches, the teaching of theistic evolution. Those who defend and promote theistic evolution change the clear teaching of Genesis chapter 1. The days of Genesis 1 were not ordinary 24-hour days, but they were long periods of time. The days of Genesis 1 were not necessarily successive days, each following upon the other, as Genesis 1 seems to be teaching. Adam was not the first human being, but he was the culmination of the development of human beings from the ape or some ape-like creature until Adam. And death did not enter the creation on account of man's sin in paradise, the eating of the forbidden fruit. But death was present in the world from the very beginning as one life form died off, giving way to a higher, more advanced life form. Those who monkey around with Genesis 1, pun intended, undermine the entire teaching of Scripture that the Bible is the very Word of God. The inspired, verbally inspired Word of God. Those who undermine Genesis 1, by implication, reject the inspiration of Holy Scripture and the authority of Holy Scripture. Even though they claim to be Christians, and even though they claim to honor the Bible 
as the Word of God. In reality, they do not. In reality, by implication, following what they teach concerning Genesis 1, they are denying the inspiration and infallibility of the whole of Scripture. So it is with the free offer of the gospel. The teaching of the free offer of the gospel implies free will. It demands the teaching of free will. And if the proponents of the free offer of the gospel were honest and consistent with their teaching, they would see this and they would admit it. One thing is sure, and that is that the churches and denominations that have embraced the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel, the members of these churches, the people in the pew, the rank and file of the people, often subscribe to the teaching of free will. I have tested this myself and have found it to be so. The people see the necessary implication of the well-meant offer of the gospel. The people are carrying the implications of the well-meant offer of the gospel to their consistent conclusion. And they are embracing the clear implication that if the Bible teaches the free offer of the gospel, it also teaches free will. Let's understand clearly the reason for the charge that the free offer of the gospel implies the teaching of free will. The teaching of the free offer is that God loves and God desires the salvation of all men, at least the salvation of all who come into contact with the preaching of the gospel. He desires to save them all, elect and reprobate alike. He gives sufficient grace to them all to accept the offer of the gospel. But if God offers them all salvation, and if God provides all of them with sufficient grace to accept the offer, but in the end, only some do. The question is, why? What's the explanation for their accepting while so many others do not but reject the gospel if they all have been given sufficient grace and the offer is made sincerely to them all? What distinguishes them what accounts for it that some only believe the gospel? Clearly, the answer must be that men themselves make the difference. If all are provided with sufficient grace, but some only accept, that must be due to their own choice, their own decision, their own exercise of their free will. That's precisely the teaching of free will. You cannot consistently maintain the free offer of the gospel without also maintaining 
if not openly, at least by clear and necessary implication, the teaching of free will. This is one of the reasons on account of which the Protestant Reformed theologian Herman Huxema alleged that the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel brought Arminianism into the Reformed churches. The well-meant offer of the gospel was Arminianism smuggled into the Reformed camp. Those who taught that the well-meant offer of the gospel in Reformed churches were guilty of Arminianism saw very clearly that the well-meant offer of the gospel clearly is sympathetic to Arminianism and defers to the Armenian teaching. That's true, especially on two counts. The Armenians taught that the preaching of the gospel was an offer of salvation. And the Armenians taught free will. For those who are promoting the teaching of the free offer, they are really only standing in the shoes of the Armenians of the past in promoting the gospel as a free offer and in teaching, even if it is only by implication, the doctrine of free will. The free will error of the well-meant offer of the gospel is condemned by Holy Scripture and by the Reformed and Presbyterian confessions. What do the Scriptures say? In Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, this is what the Apostle Paul teaches. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is the one who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That doesn't originate that willing, let alone that doing, in fallen man himself, in the sinner, outside of God's grace. But it is God who works in us, both the willing and the doing of his good pleasure. I should point out, too, that in verse 12, it's significant that the apostle says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He doesn't say work your own salvation. That reduces salvation to a matter of merit. But what he says is, work it out in all of its implications. You have been saved. Now, work out that salvation, applying it to every aspect of your life and calling in the midst of this world. In Romans 9, verse 16, the apostle says this, so then, it, 
And the it there refers to salvation. Read the text that way. So then, salvation is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, that is, doeth, but of God that showeth mercy. Salvation is not of the one who wills, nor of the one who runs. Of doesn't have its source in, doesn't originate from. The apostle is not denying here that the saved sinner wills and runs. In fact, he's teaching that in the passage that we do will and that we do run, but our willing and our running are not the source of our salvation. Salvation is not of our willing and running, but our willing and running are the fruit of our salvation. God has saved us, and in saving us, He's renewed our will, and He's given to us both the desire and by His Holy Spirit the ability to do good works. We will and we run, but our salvation is not of our willing or of our running. In John chapter 15, the Lord Jesus teaches His disciples, Ye have not chosen Me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in My name, He may give it you. You have not chosen Me. That's the function of the will. Our will chooses so that Jesus teaches here, you have not exercised your will in choosing me, but I have exercised my will in choosing you. And again, Jesus is not denying that we choose him. Of course we do. We choose to follow him as his disciples, as Jesus' disciples themselves did. We choose the things of His Word. We choose to do that which is well-pleasing in His sight. We choose the worship of His name. We choose. But the issue in the text is whose choice is first. And whose choice is the cause of the other. That's what Jesus is settling in this text. He has chosen us first. Our choice of Him follows upon His choice of us. He has ordained us. We have not ordained Him, but He has ordained us that we should go and bring forth fruit. His choice is decisive. And His choice is the cause. Our choosing of Him is the fruit and follows upon His choice of us. The teaching of Holy Scripture stands opposed to the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel because the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel contradicts every one of the doctrines of sovereign grace. We often remember those doctrines by the memory help 
of tulip. The word tulip. The five doctrines of grace are identified by the letters, the five letters in tulip. The well-meant offer of the gospel opposes every one of them. And that indicates the seriousness of this issue. And that underscores the fact that the teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel strikes at the very heart of the preaching of God's word. The well-meant offer of the gospel denies total depravity. More about that in a moment. The well-meant offer of the gospel denies unconditional election. Now, election and salvation are conditioned upon the sinner's free will, his choice, not God's sovereign choice, unconditional election. The well-meant offer of the gospel also opposes limited atonement that Christ died for and his cross is of benefit for only those given him by the Father in eternity. Only those who are elect. And the well-meant offer of the gospel opposes the teaching of irresistible grace. And more about that too in a moment. The well-meant offer of the gospel opposes the perseverance of the saints. For if salvation, to begin with, depends on the choice, the decision, the free will of the sinner, so also does his preservation in salvation depend not on the grace of God, but on his own free will. But I want to focus on two of the five points of Calvinism, as they are often called, or two of the five doctrines of grace. First, total depravity. Scripture teaches that man by nature, man in and of himself, is spiritually dead. There is no spiritual life in fallen man outside of the grace of God and apart from Jesus Christ. We are spiritually dead. The dead not only do not do any works, but neither can the dead want to do, desire to do. They cannot will to do any works. If you stand before the coffin of someone dear to you and you say to that body lying in the coffin, if you only will, will to be alive, you will be raised up. How foolish that would be if you would do that. You would probably be taken to an insane asylum. The dead cannot do, but neither can the dead will to do, desire to do, want to do. The teaching of the well-meant offer of the gospel denies total depravity in its teaching that the natural man is able to respond to the offer of the gospel. In the second place, irresistible grace. Scripture teaches that the grace of God in Jesus Christ is irresistible. 
whom he wills to save, he actually does save. Whom he wills to save, desires to save, has chosen in eternity unto salvation, he does save by the exercise of his sovereign, irresistible grace. Clearly, the well-meant offer of the gospel teaches that Christ's desire and God's will can be frustrated by the sinner. Although Christ desires his salvation, sincerely desires his salvation, and although God offers him salvation, sinful man is able to frustrate that will of Christ and that desire of God and effectively prevent his salvation. That is a denial, a fundamental denial of the irresistible grace of God in the salvation of lost sinners. The free will error of the well-meant offer of the gospel is opposed by the Reformed and Presbyterian creeds. That's the case, for example, with the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Westminster Confession of Faith devotes an entire chapter to a denial of the teaching of free will. That chapter is chapter 9 of the Confession of Faith. There are five paragraphs, not lengthy paragraphs, in the chapter. In the first paragraph, we're taught that God originally created man with a free will, natural liberty. We're taught in the second paragraph that in his state of innocency, man had freedom and power to will and to do that which is good and well-pleasing in the sight of God, but that he was also created able to fall into sin and to abuse the freedom of his will. The third paragraph teaches that man, by his fall into sin, hath wholly lost, wholly lost the ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So that fallen man, being altogether averse from that which is good and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself for conversion. Paragraph 4 teaches that when God converts a sinner, he translates him into the state of grace, freeing him from his natural bondage under sin. And by his grace alone, now enables him freely to will and to do that which is spiritually good. And then the last paragraph one sentence, the will of man is made perfectly and immutably free to choose and do that which alone is good, not in this life, but only in the state of glory hereafter. That's the Westminster Confession of Faith. That's also the teaching of the three forms of unity, the confessions of the Dutch and German Reformed churches. In the Belgic Confession, 
the last paragraph of Article 14, the article that deals with man's creation and fall, and as a result of his fall, his incapacity to perform what is truly good. The last paragraph of this article reads like this. Therefore we reject all that is taught repugnant to this concerning the free will of man. Since man is but a slave to sin and has nothing of himself unless it is given to him from heaven. For who may presume to boast that he of himself can do any good? Since Christ saith, no man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Who will glory in his own will? Who understands that to be carnally minded is enmity against God. And then at the very end of the paragraph, there is no will or understanding conformable to the divine will and understanding except that which Christ works in us. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing. The canons of Dort clearly oppose the Arminian teaching of the free will of the sinner, as well as the free offer of the gospel. This is especially the concern of the canons of Dort in the combined third and fourth heads of doctrine, which deal with the corruption of man, his conversion to God, and the manner thereof. The opening articles and the very first article talks about the fall of man, who although he was created in the image of God and that his understanding and will were adorned by God his creator with perfection, nevertheless, by the abuse of the freedom of his will, he forfeited his excellent gifts in his fall into sin. In Article 10 of that same chapter, there is opposition to the teaching of free will. I'll read just the first part of the article. But that others who are called by the gospel, notice that, called, no offer, obey the call, and are converted is not to be ascribed to the proper exercise of free will, whereby one distinguishes himself above others, equally furnished with grace, sufficient for faith and conversion, as the proud heresy of Pelagius maintains. But it must be wholly ascribed to God, who as he has chosen his own, from eternity in Christ, so he confers upon them faith and repentance, rescuing them from the power of darkness. The 14th article of the same third and fourth heads of doctrine, faith is therefore to be considered as the gift of God, not on account of its being offered by God to man to be accepted or rejected at his pleasure, but because it is in reality conferred, breathed, and infused into him, or even because God bestows the power or ability to believe, and then expects the man should by the exercise of his own free will consent to the terms of salvation and actually believe in Christ. But, but, because he who works in man, both to will and to do, a reference to what the apostle teaches in Philippians 2, 
because he also who works in man to will and to do, and indeed all things in all produces the will to believe and the act of believing itself. And the very last part of Article 16, Article 16 of this confession. Wherefore, unless the admirable author of every good work wrought in us, man could have no hope of recovering from his fall by his own free will, by the abuse of which, in a state of innocence, he plunged himself into ruin. Some conclusions. First, denial of the well-meant offer of the gospel does not make missions impossible, as is often alleged, any more than it prevents the call to repentance and faith in the established congregation. That is the error of hyper-Calvinism, the real hyper-Calvinism, the error at the other end of the extreme of those who are inconsistent Arminian Calvinists. Those are the two extremes, the hyper-Calvinists and the Arminian Calvinists. That is, hyper-Calvinism, a real error. It's not simply an imaginary error. The Reformed churches ever since the time of the apostles has fought and has been called to fight against the error, the real error of hyper Calvinism. The Protestant Reformed churches and all those who oppose the error of the well-meant offer of the gospel are not hyper-Calvinists. We are not. We repudiate that charge and both our doctrine and our history show clearly that we are not hyper-Calvinists. We call all men everywhere to repent of their sins and to believe on Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation. Protestant Reformed ministers and missionaries are able to and do preach to the unconverted, whether in the established congregation or on the mission field. And we are confident that God uses the call to repentance and faith actually to work repentance and faith in the hearts of His elect who are brought under the preaching of the gospel. Secondly, it is exactly our view that the command, the command in the preaching of the gospel works faith and repentance in God's elect that gives us confidence in our preaching. The preaching of a weak, powerless, ineffectual offer cannot inspire confidence in preaching. But our confidence in preaching is that God uses the faithful preaching of the gospel to gather his elect out of the nations and from among the generations of believers. In and by the preaching of the gospel, he not only calls them to faith, 
but he works faith. He not only calls them to repentance, he works repentance. And more than that, as they continue to hear the faithful preaching of the gospel all their lives long, God is pleased to use that preaching to keep them in their salvation, preserving them in repentance over their sins and faith in Jesus Christ. Thirdly, our rejection of the well-meant offer of the gospel does not mean that we cannot proclaim the gospel with passion. We can, and we must, and we do. How can anyone proclaim the gospel in any other way? How can anyone proclaim the gospel of God's sovereign particular grace in the cross and death of Jesus Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit lifelessly? Cold lay, matter of fact lay. No, a thousand times, no. We preach the gospel earnestly, with passion, beseeching those to whom we preach to repentance and faith. That was the attitude of the Apostle Paul as he indicates in Romans 10 the opening verses. Romans 10, 1 through 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. A zeal. Zealously, the apostle proclaimed the word of God. His heart's desire and prayer to God is that his preaching would be effective to the gathering of the church. I want to close by quoting question and answer 159 of the Westminster Larger Catechism. Question and answer 159. How is the word of God to be preached by those that are called thereunto? And the answer, they that are called to labor in the ministry of the word are to preach sound doctrine diligently in season and out of season, plainly, not in the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power faithfully making known the whole counsel of God, wisely, and now listen, applying themselves to the necessities and the capacities of the hearers, zealously, with fervent love to God and the souls of His people, sincerely, aiming at his glory and their conversion, edification, and salvation. Zealously, fervently, out of a love for God and for the souls of his people. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, Continue to use the preaching of the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, our Savior, accompanied by the call to repent of our sins and to believe 
in this only Savior for the gathering of thy church in the generations of thy people and out of the nations in missions. May the preaching of the gospel be always a sweet savor in thy nostrils, whether for the salvation and conversion of the elect or the hardening and leaving without excuse of the reprobate wicked for the everlasting glory of thy great name. For Jesus' sake, amen.